Growing up, portable gaming was a big part of my life and compulsory for long 10 hour car journeys to Scotland to see my relatives. I vividly remember the first time I ever played a portable gaming console and like many people it was with the original Game Boy. My older neighbour had one and he handed me the console with a copy of Kirby's Dreamland one day. While my mind was blown that I was playing a video game on the go, I was a bit disappointed about how crap the graphics looked. And I didn't actually have my own portable gaming system until I got the Game Boy Color so I could play Pokemon like all my fellow boomers. I'm pretty sure the sales of batteries were through the roof after the advent of the Pokemon craze. And while the Game Boy Color was a bit underwhelming in the graphics department, I still loved it and took it on every family holiday. But its successor, the Game Boy Advance, totally blew my mind when it released back in 2001 with its graphics that basically made it a portable SNES. Yes, I say SNES. I'm English. We don't say SNES. You sound like you're from London. Sure, it was disappointing that there was still no backlight or rechargeable battery, but we didn't care. We still loved it anyway. Nintendo making it backwards compatible with the Game Boy and Game Boy Color games also was a damn fine move. But later the Game Boy Advance revision, the Game Boy SP, was the perfect version of this console, with its rechargeable battery and backlit screen that makes life a constant dream. And the clamshell design made it the perfect console to chuck in your back pocket. And I still use a Game Boy Advance SP pretty much every day of my life to play Tetris DX on the toilet. And in a similar vein to the Game Boy Color, I eventually got the Game Boy Advance in 2003 for my birthday ready for the release of Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire. And I have a very happy memory of going up the big town near me to get Ruby and Sapphire with my mum, stepdad and my stepbrother. And needless to say, I played the hell out of my Game Boy Advance in a similar way to how I played my Game Boy Color. So let's talk about my top 10 favourites for the console. But before we start, please feel free to put your own lists in the comments down below. And a while back I did a top 25 PS1 game video where I got the most toxic comments I've ever had. So to preempt the ones I'll get on this video, if you comment why is an X game on this list? I'll tell you where it is. It's on your list because this is my list. I don't tend to put games on a favourites list that I don't like or haven't played strangely enough. We got two words for ya! <laughs> but without further ado, let's start the list. Konami Crazy Racers, with a K, because that's how you know this game is as cool as a polar bear on an iceberg. Allow me to break the ice. And some of you might be annoyed that this Mario Kart ripoff is on this list instead of Super Circuit, but hear me out. I, for whatever reason, really dislike Mario Kart Super Circuit. There's something about the way it controls that puts me off. And it might be because I played Konami Crazy Racers before I played Super Circuit. This game was actually one of the first games I got with my Game Boy Advance for whatever reason. I think it was included with the console for a deal with Lady Sia. Sure, those two first games I got with this console weren't the best, but when you're a kid you make do with what you've got. And by virtue of this fact, I played the hell out of this game and kind of came to have an overinflated respect for the game through nostalgia. And I do kind of like it, even though I will admit it's not the best game ever. It's kind of like the limb biscuit of video games for me. It's bad, but I can't help but love it. Keep on rolling, baby. But honestly, playing this game again after all these years reminded me why I loved it so much. It controls smooth and some of the Mode 7 on display here is actually gorgeous. This is definitely a case of a game being better than I actually remember. Sure, the character selections are a bit weird. You have Baseball Boy, Chibi Metal Gear Lad, Pippi Longstocking, There's a cat over there being, being a cat, There's Dracula, and a East Island head who has a nose like me. Look at it, look at that fruit nose. You do have Goemon from Mystical Ninja, which makes sense, and that's a series that I absolutely love. And there's also Taiko from the Proteus series, which I also have a fondness for, and I always play as him because he reminds me of one of my favorite Pokemon, Octillery. I don't understand why they didn't put in Snake and Simon Belmont. But to be fair, the characters that they picked are more visually interesting and work in this style. But the last thing I want to say about this game is that the theme tune is an absolute banger. Yu-Gi-Oh! Stairway to the Destined Duel Back in the day, I was a massive fan of Yu-Gi-Oh! I played the card game and even loved the absolutely trash tier anime. I kidnapped your grandpa, Yu-Gi, and then I dueled him into submission. Yeah, the abridged series was pretty spot on with its parody. But for whatever reason, back in the day, the Yu-Gi-Oh! games that initially came out were all absolutely awful. Most of them didn't even get the rules of the card game right. Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories being a prime contender from my youth. I've always wanted to do a video on that game, let me know in the comments if you want to see that video one day. But the first Yu-Gi-Oh game I played that actually got the rules right was this game. You play the card game and most of the rules are correct, if not translated a little bit weird. Which is definitely a step up from the games that came before it. And you literally just go around and fight different duelists and build your deck until you can win the game. It's basic, there's no flashy animations and practically no story, but I still love it because it's just fun to play Yu-Gi-Oh and build up a deck. I have a lot of nostalgia for this game that really colours my love for it, but it definitely shines like a disco ball compared to some of the other Yu-Gi-Oh games. I literally just talk to my opponents like Maximilian Pegasus the whole time I play. Yu-Gi-Oh boy! What are you, gay? Bitch I might be. 
Pokemon Emerald. Like I said in the intro of this video, the Gen 3 Pokemon games are the whole reason I got a Game Boy Advance to begin with. And back then I got Ruby, but as we all know, Emerald is the definitive version of the Gen 3 games. Which is why I picked it for this spot on the video. And while I don't quite have the nostalgia for Gen 3 as I do for the first two gens of Pokemon, I still enjoyed it and rank it as my third favourite Pokemon gen. What is there to say about Gen 3 that hasn't already been said? It improves on the first two games mechanically and comes packing with beautiful 16-bit graphics. What more could you want? Oh, and it has Mudkip. Everybody loves Mudkip. Here's a Mudkip. Do you like it? Do you like Mudkips? On Amusha Tactics. Many of you might not know this because I've never really talked about it on my channel before, but I'm a massive fan of the Onimusha series. I love all four of the games that are on the PS2, with Onimusha 2 being one of my favourite games of all time. And another thing you might not know is that I love tactics RPGs like Fire Emblem and Disgaea. So what do you get if you combine two things that I love a great deal? You get Onimusha tactics, and I absolutely love this hidden gem. A hidden gem? Well, I think that might be my kind of game. This game is a pretty basic tactics RPG, but the unique enemies of the Onimusha universe really help keep it interesting to me. But the translation could honestly be a bit better. If you weren't my brother, I could really go for you. I'll be at the front traumatized, bye. But even when I was recording the gameplay footage for this video, I got hooked and ended up playing for three hours. I only needed about 30 minutes of footage. And that reminded me why I love this game so much. It's just cheesy tactics fun and you get to see people from Onimusha 2. Win-win. Who'd want a red bald head like you? Super Mario Bros. NES Classics version. Many of you might already know this, but as a child back in the 1800s, the first game I ever played was Super Mario Bros. on the SNES re-release Super Mario All-Stars. And playing this game basically changed the whole course of my life and gave me a lifelong love of video games. And to be honest with you, the first Super Mario Bros. is probably still my favourite Mario game to this day. So now you might be thinking, why the hell is a re-release of an old NES game on the Game Boy Advance with no significant changes this high up your list? Well, the reason for that, dear viewer, is because this is the version that I first managed to beat the game on. Sure, I'd obviously beaten it on Super Mario All-Stars many times over the years, but that version is the game's journalist version where you could get infinite continues. <laughs> And I wanted to beat this game the old fashioned way with no continues. So many many years ago I spent weeks on my breaks at my job that I had at that time practicing and learning where every hidden one up was. I'm not going to say this game is the hardest or anything but it was a wrong from my childhood that I wanted to write. After a bit of practice I could run through the whole game like nothing until it came to world 8 which would always get me. Time after time I would get to the last castle and fall at the hurdle that was the annoyingly placed hammer bro. But on one magic run I got past the git and past bowser and I'd finally beaten the game properly. And I've got to admit this made me emotional, this was me coming full circle and beating the first game I ever played with this GBA version. HA! <laughs> GAY! Bomberman Tournament Something else you guys might not know is that I'm a massive fan of the Bomberman series of games. Along with Super Mario All-Stars, Super Bomberman 3 was one of the first games I had with my Super Nintendo growing up, and I played the hell out of this game both in single player and multiplayer. And over the years I would always play whatever new Bomberman game would come out. And when I heard of a new Bomberman game called Bomberman Tournament coming out for the GBA, I knew that I had to have it. And I was assuming this was going to be another normal Bomberman game where you clear levels and fight bosses. But that's not what this is. It's basically what you'd get if you combine the 2D Zelda games with Bomberman and a little smattering of Pokemon for good measure. You wander around an RPG-like world and use the normal mechanics of a Bomberman game to fight your enemies. And there's even little peaceful towns in between areas. Oh, those towns. Always so peaceful. As you go through, you collect different Fakemon that operate like key items in a Zelda game. And you can always battle these creatures in a little side game that's as shallow as a puppy's piss puddle. But I still enjoy it. And the dungeons in this game kind of work like the old school Bomberman games with you clearing a bunch of rooms and fighting a boss. So yeah, you're going around clearing a bunch of temples. Yeah, it's Zelda Bomberman. And I like it. Seriously, why is this game called Bomberman Tournament though? That doesn't make it a goddamn sin. Mother 3. Growing up, like many people, my first exposure to the Mother series of games was seeing Ness in the N64 classic Smash Brothers. And for years I wondered who the hell this character was because in the UK we never got Earthbound. But with the advent of emulation in the 2000s, I finally got to play this classic JRPG. And it really gripped me because I love RPGs and I love anything with a strange sense of humour. And this game had that in spades. 
but I later found out that Mother 1 and 3 were never released outside of Japan, and I of course wanted to play Mother 3 because I heard it was amazing, and thanks to the work of a few fans of the game translating it, I finally got to play it in the 2010s. I had a particularly bad case of the flu and I was laid up in bed sick off work. I'm sick! <laughs> And I got the fan translated ROM and played through the whole game in bed while I was ill. And this game was everything that Earthbound was, and more in many ways. It still had the zany sense of humour and the strange art style, but it just felt more epic and emotional. Not that Earthbound wasn't those things though. And I really just love all the characters and the vibe of this game, much like I did with Earthbound. I vividly remember getting near the end of this game in the throes of my flu fever and my eyes watering from the game's story and my high temperature. I don't want to ruin it, but it's definitely a game you need to experience if you like funny RPGs with a big heart. Mega Man Battle Network 3 Surprisingly, when I was younger, I wasn't the biggest Mega Man fan. Not that I hated him or anything, I just never got to play it. Sure, these days I'm a big fan of the NES platformers, the PS1 game Legends, oh, and Mega Man X Command Mission and Network Transmission on the GameCube. But my first exposure to the series was actually Mega Man Battle Network 3, which I just bought on a whim at a game shop one day. And through this game, I got bloody obsessed with the Battle Network series and seeked out every game in it. I even got the DS entries the day they came out with my brother in Blue Water, a big shopping center in the UK. There was an anime and a manga along with this as well that I absolutely lapped up even though it was incredibly cheesy. And I enjoyed every entry in the series apart from the first one which was a little bit naff. But none ever surpassed this third entry in the series for me. I actually enjoy the relationships between the characters and the premise which is really fun. Basically Mega Man and his friends are like little AI digital assistants so you can battle like Pokemon when you jack in as they say. Oh my. And bouncing back and forth between the digital world battles and the story of the real world is so awesome. But the battle system is what gets me hooked every time. It's basically like a deck building card game and a weird 1v1 fighting game combined. It makes every encounter enjoyable because you can get more cards to beef up Mega Man. A great series that often gets overshadowed and is definitely worth your time if you've never played them. WarioWare Inc. I've always loved Wario as a character in the Mario universe. He's a fat evil git who's obsessed with gold and garlic. Who can't get behind that? You are evil? No, I am not the evil, I just uh, misunderstood. I'd always play as him in any game where he was a playable character and I love all of his spin-off games. Wario World on the GameCube being a standout. But my true obsession with Wario as a character begun with WarioWare Inc. It just embodies everything that the character stands for. Weirdness, insanity and fun. Basically, it's just a collection of weird 3 second minigames that you have to complete without losing your free lives. Sure, a first playthrough can be done really quick in a few hours with you going through each weird character's set of themed minigames and beating their boss stage. But most of the fun comes in learning each of the weird 3 second minigames and seeing what weird stuff the game will throw at you next. Some of the sets of stages are honestly so weird it's like a video game version of a show like Robot Chicken or something. But the real fun of this game comes in trying to beat your high scores like it was an old school arcade game. And this is why this game is placed so high for me. I always have times where I play this game in short bursts every day trying to beat my high scores for weeks. This game is pure madcap fun at its finest and no matter how bad of a mood I'm in it never fails to bring a smile to my face. That's beautiful man. Fire Emblem The Sacred Stones much like with Ness in Smash Bros. on the N64 being the way I found out about the Mother series, Marth and Roy being in Smash Bros. Melee for the GameCube was my way into the Fire Emblem series. Marth was actually my Smash Bros. main in Melee, which is why I felt the need to try the Fire Emblem games. But we didn't actually get a Fire Emblem game in the UK until the eponymous Fire Emblem was released in 2004 for the Game Boy Advance. At this point I'd forgotten all about it and this game sadly passed me by. But in 2006 I had my appendix removed and I was off school for a couple of weeks. And my mum, to make me feel better, asked if there was any portable game she could get me to play while I healed up. And I just randomly remembered that a new Fire Emblem game came out the year before and I would like to try it. So she bought me the game and I had the best sick week ever playing through Sacred Stones multiple times while watching movies and TV in bed. And ever since this entry in the series I've been hooked on tactics RPGs and every Fire Emblem game that comes out. Sure Fire Emblem does have a somewhat basic formula but nothing hits my brain quite like it. The battles and characters are just so much damn fun and I had a massive crush on loot as a kid. Shame there's no waifus in this one, but pairing up all your troops with the support function and seeing how they get on is always entertaining. And I always love turning Ross into a walking whirlwind of Axie destruction. My love for this game is a perfect storm of a great game mixed with deep nostalgia. And isn't that what a top 10 favourites video is all about?
And there we go, that was my top 10 favourite Game Boy Advance games and I'm looking forward to seeing your lists in the comments down below. There was a couple of games that I'm sad didn't make the cut like Final Fantasy Tactics, Monster Rancher Advance 2 and Dragon Ball Advanced Adventure. Be sure to tell me how dumb my list is down below. Anyway, thank you for watching and I will see you later.